Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, the National Science Foundation had a press conference where they revealed footage of the collapse of the large facility at Arecibo. And, well, I'm, I really kind of want to talk my way through all of this. This is a camera down in the control room, just showing how the whole thing went down, literally. That was footage by Carlos Perez, who'd set up a GoPro to record this in case this happened. And it's important to realise there were observatory staff on site when this happened. They were working in the safe areas as much as possible, but it wasn't without risk, and we are very happy to hear that nobody was injured during this collapse. Now I'm going to come back to this video, but I want to look at the second video, which is taken from a drone which was inspecting cables on Tower 4. The drone was being operated by uh, Adrian, who was one of the technicians on site, and the drone would have been sitting like right there when things started to go wrong, and I've never seen a cable failure so close. Remember, these are three inch steel cables which are carrying hundreds of tons of load. It happens really fast. The center cable has a small break, then it pulls itself out of the socket, then the other cables start failing. The cable supporting the line feed is the last one to go. Uh, the drone then turns around and we get to see the uh, platform falling into the side of the dish. We get we see material falling down and yeah, everything is over in less than 30 seconds. I mean, there's still debris fluttering down and you know, dust settling, but you can see the massive scars left in the dish and the debris that has been smashed on the mountainside. I, I don't want to turn this video into rubbernecking uh, disaster images, but I've had a lot of people ask me to talk about this and talk about the dynamics and you know where it can go from here. But before I dive back into frame by frame analysis of the demise of this, let's just take a look at what it once was. In its prime, this glorious monument to science, They're able to look back to some of the earliest parts of the universe and also look at some of our closest neighbors in ways that other instruments could not. The Arecibo telescope is truly a unique instrument. And yes, there's a bigger radio telescope, but it doesn't do radar. It doesn't have the same uh, wavelength limits. But of course, that's me cherry picking the things that Arecibo did very, very well. This is, of course, I say Arecibo. What we're really meaning is the 305 meter dish at Arecibo. There are other instruments on site, but this is clearly the most prominent one. And I believe that it should be visible from space with the naked eye if you know where to look. So let's talk about that footage. Why was there a drone there? They were using drones to inspect the cables. In fact, they had been very actively inspecting the cables because they knew the cables were going to break soon. And there's a web page here that catalogues individual strands observed breaking inside these large, thick cables. These are before and after photos, and you can see the paint popping off and wires popping out. These are bundled together strands of hundreds of steel wires. They need to be bundled so that they're flexible. And as they break, they break one strand at a time. So at the start of the drone shot, you can see three cables hanging on to the top of tower number four. The three lower cables are the primary cables that were used to support the platform. These date from the 1960s. The cable above is part of the cable system that supports the catwalk and the waveguide. There are supposed to be four primary cables, but the fourth one broke in November, which ultimately led to this collapse. But if you look on the saddle, there are a bunch of wires sticking out of the top. These are the remains of that fourth cable that broke. And if you're wondering what that black strap is that's connecting two cables, that's part of a pulley system which was used to lower the socket from the first cable that failed. It just slipped out of its socket rather than snapping. So the other two support cables were attached to a structure that was added in the 1990s. So this is a frame from later in the video. And one of them is missing because that's the one that fell out. But the one nearest us, you can see hanging down there, that's after the tension has been dropped on this. So that's where those cables are attached. Watch for them when things start moving. 
Okay, so now the video is playing at one quarter speed and the cable to watch is the one in the middle, the one, the lower one with the black strap around it. Now, you'll see it's lost a lot of paint. That is because the cables have been snapping, uh, the wires have been snapping inside the cable. And every time they do that, they just knock the paint off the exterior. So there's gonna be a single break and when a single wire breaks, the other ones shift a little to take up the load. And so there's a bit of dynamic force going on as things, the load moves around. But eventually the cable appears to just pull out of its socket. I mean, you can see in this uh, frame, there's like one or two wires that are still there, but everything else is moving to the left under the tension. So the, what happens at the end of these cables is they take all the wires and they spread them out into a wide bundle and put that inside like a cup shaped socket. Then they pour zinc inside that and the zinc of course sets. And that way you have essentially a solid metal blob at the end. And of course that's what's on the other side of the saddle being held in by this uh, structure. So now that load is being released, you've got even more dynamic redistribution of load between the other cables and they're now handling, a static load would be twice what they're supposed to handle. Of course, dynamic loads are going to be even higher. And if you look, the cable behind it is already starting to come apart and it is going to snap. But watch the cable nearest us. It's nice and clean and white, but as it becomes the main load-bearing object, just watch all those wires snapping inside of this very, very quickly. It had been doing such a good job up until this moment, but it was more than it was designed for and now it parts ways. And at this point, all the main cables have snapped and the platform is beginning to fall down under the force of gravity. You can also notice, by the way, the previously broken cable, the socket has now been pushed out the other side and that those cables that were sticking up over the top are now falling away down the back. So as the drone backs away, the auxiliary cable at the bottom of the frame, you can see it wobbling and falling down. The cable at the top is still trying to support the waveguide and the catwalk, but that is going to end up getting hit. And so it snaps and you'll see a wave go into it. Now, it looks like it snaps from both ends because of a shock uh, hitting that cable. And that force is basically coming from the destruction of the catwalk. You can see it at the top, sort of in the, the curving across. The cables from the platform are smashing through that and pulling the cable free. So all that cabling is now falling towards the dish and it will, you'll see the scars that it makes in the uh, dish as it hits the uh, surface. But also watch carefully on the left side, you can see the top two segments of the tower. I believe that is like 150 feet, um, you know, 45 meters worth of con reinforced concrete falling down. And equally, as it pans across, you can see a smaller chunk of tower number 12 falling down. So anyway, I think that's all the important things to see from the drone footage. Let's switch over to the GoPro footage from the control room. So again, I'm going to run this at a quarter speed. So looking at the triangular platform, you've got the curved azimuth arm hanging underneath it, and that runs on a circular rail. Now, as the platform begins to fall and get pulled sideways by the cable tension, this basically jumps off its rails and begins to fall down. But it also does it with such aggression that if you watch as it fades below the bottom, it actually starts to bend and break. Simultaneously, you can see the support cables for the platform just smashing through the catwalk and the waveguide. And of course, that's the force that causes the final cable to snap on the distant tower. The distant tower now begins to fall over because it has all the tension on those backstay cables that are used to keep the tower solid. Also, now Tower 12 comes down and you can get an idea for the scale of this by seeing the platforms and ladders that are attached to the end of this thing. Again, this is a horrendously dangerous place to be right now. Those cables would be lethal if you were hit by one. So again, we're really lucky that nobody was injured during this very violent event. So anyway, after the dust settled, a bunch of journalists were 
publishing photos, and these were the best photos I saw from it. Um, this is by Juan Costa of Noticel, and he actually, early on, and uh, after Arecibo's first cable failure, he emailed me a bunch of links saying, you know, trying to help me, give me clues on what I should cover. Uh, these are the uh, concrete towers. You can see the rebar sticking up there. I don't think these are up to modern standards, to be honest. Um, and that's the triangular remains of the platform, which was just thrown hard against the side of this hole, essentially like a, a slingshot. The conference center and a bunch of other buildings were seriously damaged by falling cables. Some can be repaired, some will have to be demolished and rebuilt. But even before the cleanup can start, they're going to have to clear roads. This is a uh, tower number eight. The top of this has basically blocked one of the access roads. There will be a massive cleanup operation for months to come. And I would love to think that in the future, there is the will and the money to rebuild something in this space that is comparable and as functional and as important to not just the scientific community, but to the local populace who saw this as a, an important part of their island. There are, of course, petitions already being set up to try and put some political pressure on various people to make something happen. And again, I think the National Science Foundation have pretty much said there is a standard process for, you know, bidding and proposing such contracts, which is sort of code speak for if something comes up with its sufficient merits, it might be considered. But uh, equally, I think that big projects like this are very much driven by politics. And in that front, Puerto Rico has a problem because it doesn't get the same representation as the states in the United States. But as a site for future projects, the existing site has many advantages. It's already gone through a lot of the environmental impact uh, requirements. It has the radio quiet zones already figured out. And perhaps most importantly, there's a bunch of local people that have already worked on such. They've grown up with this telescope and they understand how to make something of this magnitude work. I really hope that we will be looking forward in a few years' time to what will be on this site, as opposed to merely looking back at what was on this site. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly <laughs> safe.